Turn in your Bible, if you will, to 1 Timothy, would you please? The book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, as uh, we begin our study of this great book of the Bible. And as always, I would encourage you to read the entire book. It's not very long, and so uh, in order to grasp this and retain it, I would encourage you to read it once a week. You can easily do that. And um, so 1 Timothy, chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Bless uh, our time together, Father, as we look into your word. I pray that you might uh, give clarity to me as I try to communicate it. But I also ask you for, um, for open and teachable hearts that are open uh, because of your Holy Spirit working in people's lives. Give us, give us a concentrated ability today to, to look at your word, and uh, may it bear fruit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that most of you have probably never heard of this individual that I'm going to mention. Um, his name was Chick Korea. I don't know that that's his real name, Chick. Um, probably Charles something, but he was called Chick Corea. He was a legendary jazz pianist, um, but he was uh, an outstanding composer and musician, uh, highly trained in classical music. He loved classical music, loved uh, that, but he, he's known for being a jazz pianist, and he passed away recently. He died uh, back in February. Uh, I think it was February 9th um, at the age of 79. Now, whether you like jazz or not, that is not really uh, the issue in regard to why I'm talking about him. Korea did something that most did not during his career. And what that something was is that he took other musicians under his wing, young, aspiring musicians that he saw had potential he mentored them. He invited them into his world and then uh, taught them what he knew. He invested in them, befriend them, develop them, and then try uh, to create opportunities. He opened doors for them to, to play uh, in various venues. I was reading an article by one of those musicians by the name of John Patatucci an individual mentored by Chick Corea. And in the article, Patatucci said this concerning him. He said, quote, he would pick somebody whose style he thought worked with his, then he would just bring you into his world. For somebody like me, that was so exciting. My brother's a pastor, and he says that whenever you're mentoring or teaching somebody, it's a combination between invitation and challenge. You invite someone into an experience and then challenge them. Patatucci said, without Chick, I wouldn't have become an international touring musician the way it happened. And then Patatucci said concerning his friend these words, he believed in me. There are multitudes of people who can say that, that there was someone that influenced them and that took them under their wing and nurtured their lives. 
maybe even here this morning, as I was talking about that particular situation, you thought of somebody that had an influence on your life that way. Maybe that, were, maybe those people or a per person was a parent or a teacher or a coach or a youth pastor or maybe even a pastor. Who knows? As we approach this book of 1 Timothy, what I want us, I do want us to see the teachings of the book. But I want us also to notice as the, the relationship that existed between Paul and Timothy. Paul was Timothy's mentor. Timothy was the mentor. And in these first few verses especially, we see this authoritative mentor. We think, see his relationship to this young minister, Timothy. Verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle by Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Now, out the gate, he is introducing himself, which is a common way in these old, uh, these old writings, in New Testament writings, in letters that they introduce themselves first. But Paul calls himself an apostle by the commandment of God. Did you catch that? Especially coming out of 2 Corinthians when we were talking about how people were questioning Paul's office as an apostle, they were questioning whether he had any authority to speak for Jesus. And as we went through the book, you saw how he defended the fact that he was an apostle. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Um, Paul, out the gate, is establishing the fact that he was called to be an apostle by God himself. So... Um, uh, this was the authoritative office that he is declaring here. But I want you to notice something more. Look at verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. This is written by somebody who did have a very authoritative office, but this was written by someone who cared for this individual deeply. My own son in the faith. There was a close fatherly relationship that existed between Paul and Timothy. That phrase right there, my own son, in the original language, there is a word used for a legitimate son, Nessius, Genesius, and as opposed to another word for an illegitimate child, Nothos. Paul uses this word, Genesius, and what he's Emphasizing there is the fact that this relationship between them is filial. It is father-son in a very, in a genuine sense uh, between these individuals. You know, there are sometimes people that use language that's endearing, but it doesn't mean anything. Some years ago, I was, I was having a, a breakfast, I believe, with an older pastor, a guy who was probably my age now. Okay, I was young. He was old. And uh, we had a waitress that was from the South. And she called, she uses the words honey and deer pretty freely. And as she's taking his order, he call, she called him honey. And, and she goes, I'll be right back, honey. He didn't say it to me. She said it to him. And so she, she walked away. I leaned over to him. I said, she just called you honey. And he kind of reacted to that. And, and, but it didn't mean anything because she called everybody honey and dear. This means something when he calls Timothy his own son. It's the idea of my genuine, my very own son. Paul, whether or not, I, we, there's no indication he had any natural born children of his own. There may be an indication that he was once married and was now a widower. But the point being is this relationship was filial. This was a, a from all outward and genuine uh, uh, an onlooker would say those, those two guys are father and son my own son it's not the first time he's called him that he refers to Timothy that way in 1 Corinthians 4.17 for this cause have I sent to you Timothy who is my beloved son in uh, 2 Timothy 1 verse 3 I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of the 
day and night in my prayers. He prayed for Timothy every day. Philippians chapter 2, verse 22, but you know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. So Paul is making a point because this letter is going to be read by other people that Timothy had this special relationship with the Apostle Paul. So there's a third thing or another thing in regard to this relationship is that Paul was not simply his mentor. He was not simply his uh, father figure, if you will, or father. But he was someone who wanted God's absolute best. Verse 2 again. He uses a phrase that is only found here. Grace, mercy, and peace. Now, grace and mercy is mentioned other places in a, in a salutation. Or grace and peace, or mercy and peace. But this is the only place where it says grace, mercy, and peace. Uh, It's in the pastoral epistles. From God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. He wanted, this is a triad blessing we call. It's a full blessing. And the idea is that Paul wanted God's absolute best for Timothy. The very name Timothy means one who honors God. And uh, he came to faith through his mother and his grandmother, Paul apparently met him when he was quite young, and probably Timothy is in his, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s at this point. Paul is probably in his 60s. Very, very special relationship between the two. So this is an authoritative mentor to a young minister. Then in verse 3, we see what I'm calling a synopsis for edifying ministry. Paul tells him in verse Three, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus Ephesus when I went to Macedonia. Paul had asked Timothy to stay put. Apparently they were ministering together. Paul had to leave and go to other ministry. But he said, Timothy, I need you to stay here. And so Timothy did. He stayed where Paul needed him to stay. Paul knew that there were individuals there, both in the church and in the town where the church was, that needed to be kept watch over. I knew an older guy many years ago who said this to me. He said, a new broom sweeps clean, but an old one knows where the dirt is. (laughs) And I, I... Over time, I really got the fullness of what he meant. Paul was the old broom. He knew where the personalities and the influences were there at the church in Corinth. And Timothy didn't. And so this is why he's nurturing Timothy, because there were influences there in the church there at Ephesus that Paul knew were going to raise their ugly heads and were going to be espousing false doctrine. So he tells them, tells him to stay there. And keep watch over the situation. Notice again in verse 3, the end of verse 3, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. He was to stay put and stand firm there. He was to be the controlling influence to keep falsehood out of that local church. So that when they did raise some other doctrine that Paul had not conveyed under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Timothy was there to challenge it and to to squelch it. He was there to keep it under wraps, to keep control in that situation. Some years ago, I had a pastor ask to meet with me. He was considering taking a certain church. I happened to know the church very well, that body of believers. I knew that there was very, very strong personalities within that church that had controlled things for a long time. And, you know, in their case, it was their way or the highway. I knew that the pastor there had kept those people. um, In fact, some, in a couple cases, had removed them from leadership positions. But this guy's this guy was talking to me, was going, thinking about taking that church. And so I, he asked to meet with me, which I did, and we sat down together, and I talked to him about the influences within there, and I told him 
this is what you need to look for, and these are people that are that that if you're going to have trouble, this is what this is where it's going to come from. He ignored me. After I told him all this, he ignored me. And six months later, he's out because of that. Now I'm not lauding my wisdom. I'm just saying that 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 is why an illustration of why Paul left Timothy in, in Ephesus. Because there were some strong influences that were going to be there that he needed to recognize for one thing. He had, he had a twofold duty to recognize false doctrine and then when it raised its head to shut the discussion down when it went that direction. Paul had, in, he had imparted while he was there truth. Inspired truth from God about the gospel that Jesus died to take our sin away, to forgive us, to make us just before a holy God, that we would be considered righteous, that we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Paul had conveyed all that truth to them. Right? But there were people in and around that church that wanted to add things, that wanted to plant things within that body of believers that Timothy was to watch over and that he was to uh, shut down when it was introduced. And in verse 4, it tells us the kinds of things that were being pushed in the context of that, of these false teachers. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. Now, the word fables in in the Greek, translation of the Greek, is the word muthos, which we get our word myth from. Um, Endless genealogies and myths. Now, what were these things? Well, we're not exactly sure um, because of what it says in verse 7 when it talks about people who desire to be teachers of the law we think that these these issues were among Jewish professed Jewish Christians that were among the church at that time who were people who were introducing extra biblical narratives um that were extant at the time. Now, let me, I'll give you uh, an illustration of this or what we think it is. During the period before, uh, in between the last book of the Old Testament being written and the first book of the New Testament, that was about 400 years. And there were some writings, Jewish writings, that had been collected that were known as, and they were known as the Apocrypha. Have you heard that term before? Okay. They were a collection of writings in that 400 years that began to be very highly esteemed by Jewish people during that time frame. They didn't necessarily regard them as scripture, but they regarded them as, they had a very high reverence and respect for them. And these writings sometimes were fanciful. Some, Some of these books were historical, like during the time of a group called the Maccabees, but other of these, these books are very fanciful writings. And sometimes, some, of the, some people think that this is what was being brought up within that church. Now, the apocryphal books, you will find that in the Roman Catholic Bible. You will also, in the original King James Bible, you will also find the apocrypha in the King James Version when it came out in 1611. Even some of the, if you've ever seen an older Bible, one of those great big thick Bibles, you know, that sometimes people have. Some of those old, old Bibles, you look in them, they're King James Version, but they will have the Apocrypha in that. And the King James translators did not think that they were inspired, they just thought they were helpful um, in, in various ways. So, some people think that this was Apocryphal stuff. There were also narratives going around, even about um, the early days of Jesus that were fanciful uh, stories that were being introduced to the early church. Uh, like when Jesus was little. Here's one of them. Um, I can't remember what uh, pseudepigraphal book it was in, but one story was Jesus was a little boy and he's making mud. Uh, he's playing in the mud. 
right? And he's forming these little birds out of clay. And it happened to be the Sabbath day that this was going on. And so somebody came out, hey, you can't do that on the Sabbath day. And Jesus, you know, said abracadabra and turned the clay birds into real birds and they flew away. That's one of the stories that was out there. Another one, another story that's floating around is that Jesus was, you know, a young boy and some older boys were teasing him and he struck them all blind because they were teasing him. Now, does that sound like a biblical story? No, that doesn't sound, that's totally contrary to the nature of Christ. And, but these kinds of stories were floating around. These were, would qualify under the idea of fables. These are just extraneous fantasy kinds of stories that were going around. And they were not to regard these kinds of things. The endless genealogies might refer to one of two things. There was a movement at the time called Gnosticism that believed in a cascading um, realm of celestial beings that were less and less powerful. And so uh, this genealogy uh, may refer to that. I don't think that's it, but some of the scholars say that that might be what he's talking about. What I think these endless genealogies is, was uh, what were Jewish people that were preoccupied with tracing their ancestry back through the ages to certain tribes that were supposedly of more importance or more special than other tribes like the tribe of Judah or, or Levi, you know, tracing it back, uh, their lineage, and it just they kept being more and more preoccupied. It's an interesting thing. You ever trace your own genealogy? Did you ever seek that out? It's kind of interesting at times to trace that out. You know, I've had people tell me, you know, and it's supposed to be special, you know, they, you know well, my genealogy, I traced it back to the pilgrims. You know, my, my great, 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 he was a pilgrim. Okay. What are you? <laughs> what does that make you? Does that make you special? Uh, but in, in Jewish times, to trace, to trace one's genealogy back to some special individual that was notable in biblical history, that was, that was a big deal. And so this may be referring to that, people talking, and their place in, in, the, in standing. You know, it's like the guy who's related to a pilgrim, he's here, but, you know, you know I'm I'm here or you're here. That may be part of it. The point of this is, even though we don't know exactly what this is, we do know that it was not biblical. It was not Bible stuff. It was not based on truth. It wasn't inspired truths sent from God. It was something that people got off on a tangent on. So he tells Timothy, recognize it and shut it down when it starts. It's extra biblical. It doesn't matter. And notice what else he says in um, verse 4, which minister questions. Endless genealogies, these fables, which minister questions. But they don't minister answers. It just, you know, this question, and it leads to another question. It, reads, it leads down rabbit trails. So you follow it here, and then it veers off there, or veers off here, and it always just makes more questions. I don't know if you've ever had a night of discussion over things that are conjecture, and you feel like you've talked all night and not arrived at any conclusions, and you think to yourself, I just wasted three hours of my life. These extra-biblical writings and speculations that just prompted questions, and the questions just keep on coming. Someone said this. He said, anyone who's been in the Lord's work for any length of time will have met people who come forward after a service to quarrel over a non-essential issue. Such quibbling is not edifying and does not promote godliness. It does not produce the orderly living that stems from true faith in the Lord. Christian doctrine has no place for silly arguments put forth by carnal, worldly-minded people. So Paul told Timothy to put a stop to pointless speculations. Stay put, stand firm, and then thirdly, stick to the main task. Stay on point. Look at verse 4. 
Don't get heed to the fables, endless genealogies, which just cause questions, rather than godly edifying that is in faith. Do that. Don't allow this other stuff to, to infiltrate. On the contrary, major on things that are conducive to edification. It's going to You know what edification is? That's just growth. which is in the faith. In other words, he's talking about maturing in the faith, growing in the faith. You get saved. It, when you come to Christ, then what, what's, the, what's the next thing? The next right thing is growth. Maturing in your faith. Developing your walk with God. And by the way, that is not, that's not based on how many Bible verses you have memorized. There are people who have advanced degrees in Bible but are not growing Christians. Growth is the main thing. Don't major on things that are not going to cause growth. Now, what does growth look like? Look at verse 5. This is what growth looks like. He says, now the end of the commandment, the point the telos in the Greek, the end, the point, the objective of this commandment. And by the commandment, he's not talking about an Old Testament commandment. He's talking about what he just said to Timothy in verses 3 and 4. I left you there in Ephesus to do something. This is what I want you to do. Not allow any of this other goofy stuff to enter into the discussion there. But that which is conducive to growth and the end of this, the point of this commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Now, let's unpack that just a bit, okay? Growth, he says, do that which is conducive to growth. And growth is defined by a sincere love of others. Charity is the word love out of a pure heart. That word pure means clean. It's clean heart. A sincere love for the Lord and a sincere love, a clean love for others. Second Corinthians 6, 6 talks about a love unfeigned. It's unfaked. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, he says, See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently, a clean heart. Allowing these controversies based on these frivolous, pointless fables and debates about genealogies was not going to produce anything but tension and ill will. You can get off the main track. There's a pastor that was telling me um, during all this COVID uh, stuff that a controversy has erupted in his church about, and I mentioned this some weeks ago, but a controversy erupted in his church about whether or not masks, wearing a mask, was an assault on the image of God. And when the government tells you to wear a mask, the government is telling you, now get this, this is, stay with me here. The government is telling you to do something that is uh, disgracing or defacing the image of God. Do, do you understand? This is falsehood. Don't accept this as truth, okay? That, that is what you're doing if you're wearing a mask. And so they were raising a problem within that church. And this family was, they talked for hours to the pastor about this. And this was, this was a line in the sand thing they were drawing. And if it didn't change, they were leaving. One of the pastors of the church said to them, well, why are you limiting it to, to, to mask? You wear clothes, right? I mean, we're, you cover your... You cover, cover your body with clothes. Is that an assault on the image of God? But they had decided this was a the hill to die on. And you know what that you know what that does? It's not only false. I mean that's go, that's it's a goofy thing. Whether or not you like masks or not, this is not a theological issue. You may hate masks. Okay, fine. But it's not a theo don't make it a biblical issue. It's not. And what they were doing, going to seed on that, was causing tension within that local church. Not a sincere love. They may have told, well, I really love you, brother, but we're going to let this thing interfere with that. 
we're going to break fellowship with you because of this. If that any any protestations of love are feigned, they're fake at that point. You've let something else infiltrate. So these controversies, these frivolous, pointless fables and debates about genealogies weren't going to produce love. And he said, edifying in the faith has that component. You ought to care about each one in this room as part of your local church. They ought to be considered your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you ought to have a concern for one another. And that involves knowing one another and interacting and all of that in order to, to express love. That is part of it. That's growth. But then he says a good conscience in verse 5. The end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. Not a clear conscience, a good one. The word is specific. It is a morally good conscience, an inner sense of being right with God. Here's what I'm defining this for you. It's an inner sense of being right with God and with others without the discomfort of guilt. A good conscience is a tender conscience that is sensitive to sin, but it's also a conscience that is aware of God's love and forgiveness. And there's a balance there. They go together. The more you are sensitive to God's love and forgiveness of you, the more sensitive you are to sin. You care about being right with him. Some professed believers who profess a love for the Lord, they're clearly not sensitive to sinful living. They don't even think about their conduct. That's not a good conscience. There was an individual some years ago in a church that we attended. This is when I was in Bible college. Um, who violated this next one, this, this next trait of genuine uh, growth, which is genuine faith. He was part of a church that I, we were part of that had several hundred people, and, and people just didn't know each other. You could go to church there for a year and not know even half the folks there. You, there, there, must, there might have been four or 500 people there. It's just very difficult to get to know people. And I worked at the time at an auto parts place, and I worked the counter at an auto parts place, and he came in. This guy attended church every week. He came into the auto parts place. I knew him. He didn't know me. And he was with a bunch of his friends, or a few of his friends there. And as I'm or getting the parts and looking up the parts for him, he's, he's engaging in some very dirty humor and salty language. And, but at church, he was a different guy. You know, he, he, he had one way of displaying himself at church, but he didn't know that, you know, that I was part of that. And maybe I should have told him, but I didn't. I just listened. And he was one way outside of church and another way in church. That is a faith that is, that is fake. This word, when he says unfeigned faith, and of faith and fame. The word for unfeigned here is the word that we get our word, hypocritical. It's a hypocritical faith that is insincere and put on. And it's not the same, that is not the same, folks, as inconsistency. You know, if I were to ask you, are you as consistent as you want to be as a, as a believer? I would say probably the majority of you who, who are in your right mind would say, no, I'm not as consistent as I would like to be. I don't think there is a believer anywhere that looks at their own selves, looks at their life in, in, in a reasoned way that says, I, I live flawlessly. There's not one of us. But there is a distinction, folks, between acknowledging your own inconsistency and pretending to be something that you're not. There's a, there is a distinction between inconsistency and hypocrisy. Paul is admonishing Timothy, don't engage in all this, this stuff with fables and endless genealogies and all these things that just cause questions. Don't do that. Such talk is just useless. It's empty verbiage. Don't deal with it. I was reading this article this past week 
a survey. This, this author was somebody who said that in order to draw a crowd, we need to preach, us preachers need to preach on things that people are interested in. And they had taken a poll of 20,000 people. I don't know the constituency, but it, they asked these people, what would they like to hear people, preachers preach on? What would interest them to come to church and sit through and listen to a message? The number one thing, and this guy was advocating, we need to preach on things that are people that are interested in, not on things that people are not interested in. And the number one topic that people wanted to know were, was whether there were aliens in the Bible and what did the Bible say about aliens. Aliens! Now that would be some kind of edifying stuff to my Christian life to whether or not the Bible talked about Martians. And he was advocating this. You want to draw a crowd? You've got to preach on things that people are interested in. And then I think he probably said, you can slip the gospel in. That's not our task. Our task as believers is to be a witness to a people to Christ, to try to lead them to Christ. But our task as believers in a local church is to preach on things that help us grow. Now look at verse 6, because he gives a warning here. It's a veiled warning. But it's a warning about being diverted and how easy it is, the ease of digression. Notice what he says. Do things that are edifying to the faith, which is uh, you know, pure love, um, good conscience, and of sincere faith, which is from which some having swerved. In other words, they're not preoccupied with growth and walking with God. They are preoccupied with other stuff. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. Now that's a term we don't use much, vain jangling. We'll talk about that in a moment. That word swerve literally means miss the mark. They got sidetracked from edifying growth and a sincere love of God and others and a good conscience and a sincere faith, and they've turned aside. You know, Stephen Covey, I think, was the one that said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Some of these people swerved. They got their eyes off the main thing, and they started getting involved with other things. I don't know how many parents that I've talked to through the years that decided that they were going to choose a church that their children liked. And they were going to choose a church based upon how much fun a kid had at church. Because they said, if the kid's having fun at church, he's going to want to keep going. So fun, fun was going to be the determining factor. Now, it makes you wonder, did they choose a school on that basis? Well, this is a really fun school. This is a really dud school. They can really have fun here. Or did they choose their children's diet by how fun? You know, when our kids were young, they wouldn't go to McDonald's because of the little toys that they, you know, <laughs> they could get toys when they went to McDonald's. I mean, it doesn't matter what the food is. <laughs> it's all about the McToys. How biblical it is, is it to choose a church based on how much fun you have? Now, I don't think church ought to be drudgery. I mean, I try to work hard to, make, to keep people's attention, keep them engaged, and to keep them in the word. Now, not to be drudgery, but then again, fun is not the point. What's the point? Grow! They swerved from that. And turned aside unto, but the King James says, vain jangling. Random talk. It's empty, pointless talk. It's idle talk. It is true trash talk. It's, it's not good for anything. It's garbage. 
It might be talk that is animated and intense about some new and novel topic, but it's, it's not helpful, it's not edifying from a truth perspective, and it doesn't produce holiness of life or much love and devotion to the Lord. It's just talk. Useless talk. Not talk that's going to result in growth. Warren Wiersbe said this, it's, an unfortunate, it's unfortunate today that we not only have useless talk, meaningless talk, vain jangling, as the King James says, in teaching and preaching, but also in music. He said this, he said, this is Warren Wiersbe is speaking here, he said, far too many songs not only teach no doctrine, but may even teach false doctrine. A singer has no more right to sing a lie than a teacher has to teach a lie. So, he talks to Timothy about how, how easy it is to digress and how it results in trash talk, the deviation of talk. But quickly, in verse 7, and I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this tonight, but notice verse 7, from which some have turned aside desiring to be teachers of the law. These people, some of these people desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Paul says, these people who want to be esteemed as rabbis, this is what a rabbi, a teacher of the law was called in that day. They desire to have the esteem and the respect of a rabbi. This is what they want. They don't understand what they're talking about. He's talking about people who really didn't know Diddly. One commentator said this. He said, the problem with these false teachers, as is often the case, was a matter of the ego. They wanted to become respected teachers of the law, and that they were completely incapable of doing so. But instead of recognizing their inadequacies and remaining silent, they went on babbling as if they had great authority, neither understanding their subject, the law, or what they were saying about it. They did not have a clue. And Paul's telling Timothy, he said, don't let them get up and spout this stuff. Their egos are what is driving them. They want to be rabbis. Sometimes when churches or any organization, for that matter, gets into trouble, they are said to be in a power struggle. But often it's not a power struggle as much as it is an ego struggle. There's somebody who wants a place in the sun. And that is diverting them. Their ego is diverting them. Let me ask you a question as we close. In fact, I'm going to ask several questions. And I want you to take them in the, in the spirit in which they're given. But based upon this passage of scripture, how is your heart? How is your conscience as defined here? Not, not the way Jiminy Cricket defines conscience. Talking about a heart that is walking, you're walking with God and you're a growing, are you a growing Christian? Are you a growing believer? And are you getting more loving toward your brothers and sisters in Christ than you were years ago? Are you growing? Is there a sincere love? For one thing, is there a good conscience? You're walking with God and your heart is right toward God. And is your faith genuine? Your walk with Jesus, is that genuine? I'm not trying to make, I'm not trying to foist a guilt trip on anybody. I'm just asking some questions. Are you a growing believer as defined from this passage of Scripture? You have an inner sense of being right with God and with others. You have a genuine faith in Jesus. Do you know the Lord and are you walking in fellowship with him? If the answer is no, then I would suggest that you've gotten distracted by something. It's caused you to swerve and go a direction that has not been conducive to growth and maturing and that you need to get back to where you need to be. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your truth. Thank you for the word here. And I pray that we would that we would keep 
the main thing, the main thing, that we would, that in our heart of hearts, our, our desire would be to walk with you, to, to love you and to love the people that you love and to have a good conscience and a genuine faith that can be seen by others. And Lord, I pray that you would do a work within your people here uh, this morning. I pray during this time of invitation that you would impress upon hearts that in this quietness of our are contemplating what the word has said, that you would work within individual hearts and cause them to draw close to you. Help them to recognize what has been, what has diverted them, what what has caused them to swerve. Help them to recognize that and to get back to the main thing. Pray these things in Jesus' name. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask us to stand. And there, while you're standing in quietness, meditating upon the word as the pianist begins to play, I wonder if there are some things that you need to maybe get settled with God right now. It's between you and he. Lord, I've allowed this in my life, and it has not drawn me close to you. I've been preoccupied with things that are with things and thinking that has not been conducive to growth, but has actually steered me away from a good conscience and an unfeigned faith. Forgive me and restore me. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your mercies to us in the person and word of Jesus. And I pray that as we've looked inside of our hearts today, um, that you would do a work of grace within us. Um, if there's anybody listening either uh, here this morning or, or over um, online, uh, I just pray that if they're not sure where they would spend eternity, that you would impress upon them to seek uh, someone who knows Christ out and to seek that person out and to get these matters settled as to their walk with you and whether or not they have been forgiven and given eternal life. We thank you for our time together and we pray that we would go forth stronger, better uh, representatives of Christ Jesus as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are dismissed. God bless you.